Good morning, and thank you all for being here uh, today, here in late June of 2021. Uh, I firmly believe that uh, Mississippi is on the move and our economy is growing, and there are a number of reasons for that. Uh, one of those reasons is a pro-growth, pro-business approach to governing. With respect to that, back during the 2021 legislative session, I had the opportunity to sign uh, House Bill 1263, which was authored by Representative Becky Curry, which is called the Universal Recognition of Occupational Licenses Act. Universal recognition is a loss for governmental bureaucracy and red tape, but it is a win for Mississippi's economy. Signing this act is yet another step my administration has taken to promote economic growth and attract new businesses to the hospitality state. I do want to thank Rep Representative Curry, Senator Blackwell, who is here today representing the Senate, who was very helpful in, in ushering this through on that side of the building, for their help in making this common sense legislation a reality. Under this law, individuals who relocate to Mississippi and have a license, a permit, a certificate, or other type of registration in good standing with another state will be able to receive an equivalent license to practice here in our state. Universal recognition will remove economic opportunity roadblocks and pave the way for a wave of professionals to move to the state all while still upholding the standards that protect consumers. As I've mentioned before, one of my top priorities is for Mississippi to continue to have more national board certified teachers per capita than any other state in the U.S. The fact is the best way for every kid in Mississippi to get a quality education is to have a quality teacher in every classroom. And as we look to improve and increase the number of National Board certified teachers here, this law will help us accomplish that mission by providing an incentive for out-of-state teachers to relocate here and to quickly allow them to start doing what they do best, which is educating the next generation of Mississippi students. Mississippi is one of the first states in the nation to pass a universal recognition bill and it is yet another example of us leading the way to pro-growth economic policies that will continue to lead to more economic activity and more jobs created in Mississippi. July 1st, the first day of our new fiscal year, will be a great day for our state. Thanks to this legislation, there will be many, many more great days from an economic perspective in our state. With that, I'm going to turn this over to Representative Curry, who actually authored the bill. Thank you, Governor, and thank you for always working with us. In the spirit of this legislation, it was that we want people to come and experience our state. We have such a wonderful place to live and bring your family and raise your family here. We want you to come here and buy a home, buy a car, send your children to school. But we had so much red tape that you couldn't come here and get your license. And so hopefully today that ends. Uh, Mississippi is open for business. We want you to come here and we want our state agencies, if you have not uh, updated your rules and, and protocols. You have the summer in order to get those done. Some agencies haven't changed their protocols in over 30 years, and it's time to do that. And we want to make sure that if you want to come to Mississippi and work here, raise your family, that you are welcome, and we're not going to put roadblocks or red tape up for you to do that. Thank you, Governor. Thank you. I'm Douglas Carswell. I'm the president and CEO of the Mississippi Center for public policy and today is a great day for reducing red tape and putting Mississippi on the path to prosperity. Onerous occupational licensing keeps Americans from being able to earn a living. It means higher prices, less growth and it means a worse deal for the consumer. 
This change in the law is a big deal, it's a bold deal, and it lifts restrictions on our labour market. Many uh, skilled workers who receive certification out of state will now be able to work in state. Governor Reeves is putting Mississippi on the path to becoming one of the most business-friendly states in America. Um, I applaud Representative Curry for taking real action to create jobs. There are fundamentally two ways in which a state government can create growth and prosperity. They can either uh, give handouts to try to entice big corporate interests to expand, or they can take the more difficult but more fruitful path towards making Mississippi a place where people can find work and people can do business. This achieves that. Uh, the Mississippi Center for Public Policy has long advocated for this change, and we're absolutely delighted. Thank you. My name is Ryan Miller. I'm the executive director for Accelerate Mississippi. This is your state's office for workforce strategy development. It is a joy to be here. Governor, thank you. Uh, our lawmakers are doing everything they can every day to try to make Mississippi more business friendly, but also workforce friendly. And my job is to try to be a resource for the state to help coordinate some of those efforts. This is a wonderful day. There are lots of wonderful opportunities in the state of Mississippi, not just for jobs, but for good jobs, for careers. And this type of legislation makes it easier for people to assume those careers, to step into what they might see as their dream job. And I'm excited to see that effort move forward. This is also a day in which we can communicate to the rest of the country that Mississippi is here and it can be your home. If you have a desire to come and practice and uh, participate in a trade here, uh, we're, we're open. We're, we're here for you to uh, come and continue to write your story and to write the Mississippi story. So Accelerate Mississippi is excited to be a part of this. Uh, we're grateful for our, our leadership in, in, in carving out a path for people to, uh, to fulfill those dream jobs. And uh, we, we, we thank you uh, for being here. Governor, I'll, I'll turn it back to you in case there are any questions that you all might have. Again, thank you and, and thanks to, to each of these uh, individuals that have stood here with me today representing uh, the public sector and the private sector. I, I particularly want to thank uh, Ryan for being here as the leader of Accelerate Mississippi. Uh, this is a, a, a workforce uh, development and workforce training um, uh, area in which he oversees, uh, which is going to be critical as we progress forward. We want to remove roadblocks to people in Mississippi working and for people in Mississippi working at good jobs with good high paying wages. And that's uh, ultimately where we're going to continue to move our state. Uh, I'm proud of the progress that has been made as we move towards June 30th of this fiscal year. Uh, we appear that we're going to uh, be in not only the best financial shape, but the best fiscal shape Mississippi's ever been in uh, at the end of this fiscal year, and it's because we have been open for business, and we have allowed our uh, employees to get back to work uh, so they can earn a living to provide for themselves and their families. And so with that, I'll open the floor uh, to any questions that you may have. Yes, sir. I don't think we have any specific projections, uh, but what we do know uh, is that we passed uh, similar legislation uh, a few years back uh, with respect to military spouses uh, because, for instance, uh, in our state, um, we have a large number of military bases, and if you're in the Air Force and you're training to be a pilot, um, it's often, uh, it had been difficult uh, for many of those spouses to, to be able to pick up and, uh, and move very quickly. And so this was a piece of legislation uh, that was passed a couple of years back, um, which made that easier. And, and, and it's as simple as, um, say, a military spouse who uh, cuts hair, for instance. It, it, they really shouldn't have to go through the process of um, getting a license uh, in our state when they've already got a license uh, that is equivalent in another state. When we did that, um, we, we initially got it done for military spouses, and what we found is um, it certainly made Mississippi more attractive um, for those uh, spouses to move here. And, and our view is uh, if, it's, um, if it makes sense in that particular situation, 
then we ought to um, we ought to give that opportunity to all Mississippians. And so I think you're going to see um, this being as yet another hurdle uh, to job creation that is being removed uh, in the state of Mississippi, and and I'm proud of that fact. Courtney. Well, 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 there's no question. Um, I, I'll just give you uh, one example um, of, of um, that, that we dealt with during the pandemic. As you know, um, the, the Department of, of Public Safety uh, oversees driver's licenses. And if you go to virtually any major trucking company today, anywhere in our state, uh, what you hear is a shortage of truck drivers. Truck drivers have to have a commercial driver's license. Well, when we initially took the step to close down driver's license bureau uh, at the Department of Public Safety at the early stages of the pandemic, um, one of the things that we found is that that really didn't work because everyone that was trying to become a truck driver and every company in Mississippi needs more uh, were struggling to get a CDL. And so that's an example of uh, a license that can be somewhat difficult to obtain simply because in the past, now we've corrected a lot of this, but uh, a year and a half to two years ago, I think every legislator in the state heard from people that were having a hard time standing in line getting their driver's license. Uh, well, that was very hard for individuals to get a driver's license, um, and it was even uh, more difficult in many instances for uh, individuals across Mississippi to get a commercial driver's license. And so um, the fact is, um, again, there are literally hundreds and hundreds of jobs out there uh, all throughout Mississippi um, that require a CDL um, that are open and need to be filled. And so if you uh, are a, a truck driver, right, maybe right now that lives in Tennessee that is working for an entity that's forcing you to drive from from uh, say Memphis to California uh, twice a week, and you want to um, you want to get a job closer to home, uh, then you have an opportunity to move to Mississippi to to apply uh, in, for a company uh, whose route maybe runs from Jackson to Memphis, and you don't have to uh, go cross country twice a twice a week. I hear a lot of that uh, from from individual Mississippians that are looking for a. Uh, a better uh, quality of life and a better opportunity uh, to stay closer to home. This is one example uh, of a way in which to do that. But again, there are literally countless uh, examples of licenses uh, that have proven to, to be hard to get. In many occupations, by the way, some of us would probably argue that a license shouldn't even be necessary um, to cut hair, for instance. Um, um, but clearly, uh, th there are a lot of opportunities. Yes, sir. Changing gears, if I could, Governor, the state has started some listening sessions regarding medical marijuana. Have you had any idea of what type of legislation you think this should take shape uh, as we move forward before you call a special session? <laughs> well, well uh, Senator Blackwell happens to be <laughs> sitting up here, and, um, and clearly uh, that was not by design for this particular question, uh, but Senator Blackwell uh, was a leader. Uh, during the regular session with respect to attempting to pass uh, legislation, which he was successful in getting done through the Senate and unsuccessful in getting it through the House. Um, in the event that the uh, Supreme Court ultimately overturned uh, the legislation, I've had probably, I don't know, three or four, maybe five different conversations with Senator Blackwell uh, over the last uh, three or four months. Um, both his committee and the uh, Committee on Public Health in the Senate have had uh, multiple hearings. Um, and as I appreciate it, um, uh, they are moving towards having uh, some draft legislation uh, within the next couple of weeks. Um, again, as, as you've heard me say before, and I'll say it again, uh, with respect to the Supreme Court ruling, we really have two issues that we have to deal with, uh, or at least we have two issues that I'm for dealing with. Um, we'll see if everyone in the legislature is or not. But issue number one is the actual access to the ballot. Um, I believe that people ought to have access to the ballot and and therefore I believe uh, that the legislature should deal with the uh, constitutional amendment process. 
Uh, I also believe that many of these issues that have been before the people recently uh, should not be put in our state constitution. Um, I believe that uh, there are other ways in which to do it, and, and I think uh, we need to look at that. But all told, no matter what ultimately is decided, it has to go not only before the legislature, but ultimately it's going to have to go back for the people because the amendment process is actually in the Constitution, and so the people are going to have to vote on it. Uh, short of a new election statewide, uh, which typically costs a couple million bucks, uh, the earliest we can do that is November of 2022. That's the next regularly scheduled statewide election. And so we've got a little bit of time on that particular issue, um, and it can be dealt with uh, over the next several months. Medical marijuana, on the other hand, I believe, um, while I made it clear that I was uh, opposed to the constitutional, constitutional amendment, I voted against it. Um, I also uh, respect the will of the people, and some 70-plus percent of Mississippians went to the poll uh, asking for um, and, and voting for uh, a medical marijuana program, and I believe it's incumbent upon the legislature uh, to put that in place. And I commend uh, Senator Blackwell and many of his colleagues uh, in terms of their uh, working towards uh, finding solution. We have been very engaged from a policy standpoint in that as well. Um, and I think we'll have something um, that we can uh, have serious discussions about, uh, hopefully relatively soon. Do you think there should be, I've heard this discussed, I don't know if it's your opinion or not, there should be stricter zoning requirements regarding where these businesses can operate. I don't know if you shared that opinion. Well, I, I think that's certainly a, a topic that is worth discussing. Um, I think that, um, that that is something that the, ultimately the, the legislature will decide, uh, but I think that there is certainly a strong argument um, that if, if individual municipalities have um, the ability to zone every other business within that, uh, entity, within that municipality, uh, then perhaps it's, it's worth considering uh, for these businesses as well. Jeff. Governor, uh, back to the occupational boards. In the past, I think uh, you said you, you would support it. Carswell's group has supported uh, just doing away with a lot of these regulatory agencies. We have comparatively a high number of them. Uh, any potential for that? I, I know when y'all have tried it, it's been uh, rather difficult politically, hasn't it? Uh, it? It has proven to be difficult politically, um, but. I, I, uh, for, for all of the bad things y'all write about me, you've never written that I'm scared to take on a tough fight. And, and so um, this is a, an area in which we uh, certainly uh, will continue to, to, to look at that. Um, you know, one of the things that we have done uh, as, a, as a state uh, over the last 10 years is we have uh, created the OLRC, uh, which is the Occupational Licensing Review uh, commission, which consists of the governor, the attorney general, uh, and the secretary of state. Uh, we just met literally within the last couple of weeks, which gives some oversight to an executive entity uh, in ensuring that some of these boards and commissions do not pass onerous rules and regulations. Um, this year we were able to get legislation passed also uh, that gives us some ability to review past uh, rules and regulations, and I think um, again, it's a the theme here is uh, what can we do to make it easier uh, to invest in Mississippi, and what can we do to make it easier uh, to create jobs in Mississippi. With respect to some of the boards and commissions, um, when I was lieutenant governor, I talked a little bit about uh, the need to get rid of some of those. Uh, now that I'm governor and am required to make. Uh, unbelievable numbers of appointments to boards and commissions in which there is little oversight and little uh, ability to uh, even monitor what some of them are doing. Uh, I continue to believe that uh, the number of boards and commissions that Mississippi has is way too, uh, way too many. Uh, we, need, we need fewer. Uh, we need to hold our elected officials accountable, quite frankly, and and this can be done uh, after I'm gone if that's what's seen as necessary, but uh, we ought to have significantly more uh, pieces of state government reporting through elected officials that can be held accountable um, and significantly fewer boards and commissions um, because it does um, make it more difficult to ensure that the will of the people uh, is being seen and being protected 
uh, by those elected to serve. Is there any measures in this that would prevent somebody from like, going outside of Mississippi, getting a license, and then just coming right back? Uh, not to my knowledge, but I don't think we have a major risk of that happening. Um, I think that um, w when you look at the vast majority of uh, licensing um, across state lines, um, I just don't think that's going to be something that occurs very often. For instance, it, it is not uh, significantly uh, easier to get a medical license in Tennessee as it is in Mississippi. So I think you'll see uh, very little of that happening. The response from the business community, particularly after COVID and the job shortages we've had, more excitement, hesitation, nervousness of people with different kinds of training and skills coming in and being able to take similar jobs? Well, you know, the, 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 I'll be honest with you, the, the, in my conversations with small business owners across uh, the state of Mississippi over the last two to three months, 99.999999% uh, of those conversations have centered around labor shortages and around the uh, very difficult task of actually hiring people right now. Uh, the fact is, um, if you are in Mississippi right now and you want to work, there is a job available for you. Um, the, the thing that is most common if you travel around Mississippi, particularly in small towns, if you go down virtually any main street anywhere in our state, the thing that you see more often than anything else is help wanted signs. I was in, I was at a large manufacturer, manufacturing company in Mississippi uh, two weeks ago yesterday. Uh, which was the first day that the unemployment benefits uh, were no longer in effect, the additional benefits through the pandemic unemployment assistance. Uh, that specific company hired 40 to 45 people that day alone. Now, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of employees short, uh, and they would, would hire more. And hopefully since that day, that was 15 days ago, they've been able, I hope they've done 50 a day. Um, but even if they haven't, uh, we're seeing more and more of our people going back to work. The fact is, for Mississippi to experience a full economic recovery, we got to get our people back to work. And that obviously was a, uh, a decision that I made. Uh, I believe we were the second state in the nation to uh, decide to end those unemployment benefits. Um, since that time, some 20 to 25 additional states have done it. Um, and, and the reason is because they've experienced the same challenges that we have in terms of getting folks back to, to work. Other than truckers, what what area is this bill or soon to be law going to address the issue you're talking about right now? I mean, are, are there shortages? I mean, what are the shortages? Who are you? Uh, I think, think Courtney asked you a while ago, what are the professions where people are having a hard time getting their certification? What I would tell you, Bobby, is that the, the there's a uh, unlimited number of professions that are going to benefit from this particular piece of legislation. There's, um, there's licensing requirements um, that, as Jeff said earlier, that I, I personally would be um, more than happy to completely uh, rid ourselves of. Um, but I certainly don't think that if you have to take a test to become a licensee in some other state, uh, that when you come to Mississippi that you should be, then be required to take another test. I just don't think that's, um, I don't think that's, uh, I don't think that's business friendly and quite frankly, I don't think it's consumer friendly either. And, um, and so I think, again, our, our job uh, as government, as was mentioned earlier, is what are the roadblocks to job creation and economic development and how do we get rid of them? One roadblock to job creation and economic development in, in our state has been uh, these onerous licensing requirements, and it makes it harder and more, more, um, and it takes more time uh, when you're trying to move here. We we now, uh, as of July one, will no longer have that problem. You yes, sir. Hold, I'll come right back to you. Um, are there safeguards in place for individuals that are coming into the state and have a license out of state? But the requirements for their license are less stringent than Mississippi. In other words, you know, are you going to have somebody that maybe doesn't maintain the same standards? Sure. Governor, uh, 
if you have a license in another state and you've been practicing that for 15 years with no problems and, and you're not in any trouble with that state agency in that state, you should be able to come to Mississippi and go to work. And that's why I was saying we need to look and every state agency needs to look at their protocols and, and their regulations and make sure that they are in the spirit of this law. And the spirit of it is we want people to come to work here. We want them to move here, raise their family here. And so, it, like I said, if you are working in another state and you have no problems, there's no reason why you can't come to Mississippi and go to work. And I think the, the, the question that is basically asked um, here is, uh, are there risk to consumers because of this particular piece of legislation? And what I would tell you is the answer is no. And in fact, the, the opportunity for consumers is, is significant and, and it significantly outweighs uh, any other uh, counter offers. Did I follow up, Bobby? Uh, you mentioned timing, though, with the, you mentioned teachers. Uh, what's the rules now for teachers as well? I mean, I thought there were some residual abuse first around the state. The, to their credit, and, and I don't always give them credit, but to their credit, the State Department of Education uh, has been working uh, to have uh, reciprocity agreements with other states. Um, and, and that's a good, that's, that's a good step, and it, but it's primarily with those uh, other states that uh, are, bo are border states, so Alabama, Tennessee, Arkansas. Um, but our, my view is if it's good to have uh, reciprocity uh, with Mississippi and Alabama or Mississippi and Tennessee, why isn't it good to have reciprocity across the nation? Um, and the fact is it, it is good for consumers uh, to have that reciprocity. And what we have done uh, as a state is one of the um, first states in the nation to do it is to say, uh, in, in essence, um, Mississippi is open for business, and if, if you have a license in some other state, then you can practice that particular profession here in our state. Yes, ma'am. Well, it's certainly not surprising. Uh, they threatened to sue us uh, a little over two years ago. Um, in our state, we made uh, in God We Trust, uh, part of our state seal uh, some 10 years ago. Uh, several years ago, we put uh, in our state seal, that, which contains In God We Trust, uh, on our li license plates. Uh, and since that time, uh, Mississippians went to the polls uh, and by about a 75% margin, uh, voted to put In God We Trust on our state flag. Um, the, the term In God We Trust has historical significance. Um, it is literally, if you ha I don't have many dollars, but if you have a dollar bill, uh, it is our nation's motto, and it is put, um, it has been on uh, our monetary uh, exchange um, money uh, for hundreds of years in, in this country. Uh, there have been multiple federal court rulings uh, that recognize the historical significance of In God We Trust, um, and, and the only thing um, that, that should be noted is that while this, these particular atheist groups threatened to sue me two or three years ago, uh, many of these plaintiffs that they ultimately found, and I will note that it took them a couple years to find plaintiffs to actually file the suit, um, uh, if, they've been, um, if they've been following our law, they've been riding around with these license plates uh, for multiple years, and there's no harm there. Some of the attorneys from the atheist organization yesterday, they claim they don't really want to take down In God We Trust, but for people to have an option on a license plate that doesn't have it if they choose to without having to pay extra. Do you think there's wiggle room there? Well, uh, th they may claim they don't want to take down In God We Trust, but um, the, the fact of the matter is, uh, the, and the reason they claim that, of course, is because that issue has been litigated many times in the past. Um, and if, if the federal judge who has this case follows a long-standing precedent, um, then I think uh, he'll dismiss this case very, very quickly. There was some news this week about uh, House Speaker Gunn potentially considering a run for governor. Any comment on that? Or? It's a free country. It's a great thing about America is anybody who has the intestinal fortitude to run for something and put their name on the line, 
they get the opportunity to do so. Just about alcohol distribution, we're getting ready to make some changes to the state's alcohol distribution system. Do you think we're heading in the right direction? Do you think we should perhaps take government out of it? Well, you know, it's a it's a good question, um, but it's not an easy question, right? right. And so. Um, as a general rule, uh, my gut is always going to be get government out of the way uh, and let it be done by the private sector. Um, a year and a half ago, um, Senator Blackwell, you can answer that if you need to. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who gets that ringtone, but whoever it is, they got to be really, really important, right? <laughs> um, you know, and, and I think this is this is an important point. Um, the individual members of the legislature, um, in, in key leadership positions, started talking about uh, alcohol distribution a year and a half ago, and there was a real effort uh, to develop a plan to pass legislation in the 2021 session uh, to fix this issue. And what ultimately was found is that, it's, as is often the case in government, it's just not as simple as, as we would love for it to be. And so I think you're going to see, uh, certainly we can all agree that the uh, significant increase in demand that we saw through the pandemic, that the uh, Department of Revenue was not uh, necessarily prepared for that. Um, I think they will have some ability to uh, invest some resources uh, in the current distribution facility. And the conversations are ongoing, and I am certainly uh, engaged and involved in that. And, and again, my gut is always, if you can get government out of the way, that's a good thing to do. Um, but I'll also say it certainly doesn't make any sense to increase taxes so as to increase taxes on the end user, on the consumer, and reduce revenue to the state. That is not a good model um, and one that, uh, that was one of the proposals that was uh, thrown out last year. And so again, I think we, this is a, an issue that we continue to need to work towards uh, and continue to try to solve. Well, I never thought I'd say this, but can I pay you to go around the state and, and say that over and over and over and over? Um, no, the, here, here's, the, here's the reality. Um, dating back to March of this year, uh, we made the vaccines available such that every single Mississippian that wanted to take the vaccine had access to the vaccine. Uh, and they had access to it uh, in a uh, in many instances in a drive through uh, run by, run masterfully by the Mississippi National Guard, uh, free of charge. Um, we had a lot of Mississippians. We've delivered nearly two million shots to date. Uh, and in fact, I, I don't look the numbers every day anymore, uh, but uh, I think we probably have exceeded two million shots in Mississippi. So we had a lot of our fellow Mississippians take advantage of it. There are some th that looked at it, assessed the risk, and decided that they'd maybe take a pass on the vaccine. Now, I don't recommend that. I took the vaccine in, in January so as to uh, convey to everybody in the state that I believe that they're safe, I believe that the vaccines are effective, and I believe that the more people in Mississippi get vaccinated, the better. But I also don't fancy myself as being smarter, like some of these public health experts, smarter than every single Mississippian. And I don't know things that are going on within their life that may or may not uh, change their risk assessment of the vaccine. And so I trust individual Mississippians to make their own decisions. Again, I want to be clear. I think you ought to take the vaccine. I think it's safe. I think it's effective. But I believe in your right to decide what's best for you 
and your families. And I don't think those are conflicting views. Just to ask Attorney General Fitch regarding the upcoming legal fight in the Supreme Court on abortion, she said that she doesn't know that this law would overturn Roe v. Wade, but rather define uh, life when it begins. Your thoughts on that, whether this is a eventual challenge for Roe v. Wade or not? I am for Roe v. Wade being overturned, but that is not what this lawsuit is about. Over, Roe v. Wade was decided in 1973. The Casey case were, occurred in 1992. So we have just shy of 50 years, and there have been all, multiple cases that have been tried uh, over the years. And so when you look at this particular case, it is about the court reviewing Roe v. Wade and recognizing that over that nearly 50 years, the science has changed. The fact is we know so much more about the development of babies in the womb today than we knew in 1992 when Casey was decided, much less what we knew in 1973. The technology is far advanced today compared to the early 1990s, much less the early 1970s. So we know now that we have brain development in that young child at that age. We know now that that baby is practicing breathing. We know now that that baby experiences pain when in the womb at 15 weeks. And because of that, we believe that the court should recognize the ever-evolving science and should uphold this law and not allow abortions to occur in Mississippi because that's what our statute says after 15 weeks. Thank you. Representative Curry was the author of that particular bill as well. She's a good legislator in case y'all are wondering. She has a lot of good bills. But clearly, um, while I personally would support overturning Roe v. Wade, this particular litigation is not asking the court to overturn Roe v. Wade. It is simply asking the court to recognize longstanding views that you can place limits on when abortions can occur and late-term abortions should not be allowed in the state of Mississippi. Thank you all for, for coming in today. Have a wonderful day and um, a great summer. Thank you all. You're being very effective. Yes, sir. That was a compliment. <laughs>